All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Red May 2022. My name is Kyle, one of the organizers here, and I'm uh, welcoming you all to this wonderful panel. We're all really excited to, uh, to be here with you. Um, Red May is a month-long red lecture and art series that happens every May. We are based out of Seattle, Washington, um, but due to the pandemic, we have been online um, for the past few years now. Um, and uh, we are excited to be here with you uh, virtually. We are hoping to be here in person next year. Um, and in order to do that, we are going to need to raise some money for flights uh, and money to reserve spaces to, to have our events for next year. So if you like what you've heard so far throughout the month of May, or you're interested in our project, um, there are a couple of ways that you can support us. The first one is you can do one-time donations through our GoFundMe. Um, and the links for all of these are going to be in the description box of the YouTube um, channel as well. So we have our GoFundMe page and we also have our Patreon uh, for more sustaining subscribers. The Patreon um, also gives you access to more year round content through our podcast, Project Cinderblock, which is hosted by myself and Sean Landis. Um, also wanted to let you all know about some upcoming events this weekend. Uh, so at uh, 11 a.m. tomorrow morning Pacific time, we have two or three things I know about Brecht. At 3 p.m. Pacific time on Saturday, we have the impasse of the Latin American left. And then uh, Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific time, we have art, value, and labor. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Shimon, who will introduce our speakers for today. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, introduce our speakers. The first speaker uh, today is Jean, Jana Curti, who is an assistant professor of criminal justice and criminology at Loyola University, Chicago, and editor of Hardcrackers, Chronicles of Everyday Life. And our second speaker um, is Jared Shanahan, who is a writer, activist, and educator based in Chicago. He works as an assistant professor of criminal justice at Governor State University in University Park, Illinois, and is the co-author of the book we're going to be discussing today, States of Incarceration, Rebellion, Reform in America's Punishment System. And his other uh, author is obviously Jana. So um, yeah, and he is also co-editor of Treason to Whiteness is Loyalty to Humanity, um, a Noel Ignatiev reader. And finally, he's also an editor of Hardcrackers, Chronicles of Everyday Life. Um, so let's welcome Jana and Jared. Um, hi, y'all. How you doing? How's it going, Shimon? It's great to see you. It is amazing to see you. How are you doing, Jana? Are you doing okay? So nice yeah. to see you, Shimon, Jared. Good to be here. Great, great. Um, so yeah, why are we here? We're here to discuss both of yours upcoming uh, book, uh, States of Incarceration, Rebellion Reform in America's Punishment System. It's coming out this September, 2022, so a few months away. And it's published by Reaction uh, Books. That's R-E-A-K-T-I-O-N, just in case anyone was curious. Um, and just a little housekeeping, um, we'll do Q&A um, in about, uh, would you all say 45 minutes to an hour, Jared and Jana, somewhere in that ballpark? Great, great. So, you know, if you have questions or comments, save them up. Um, you can throw them in the chat and we will um, get to them accordingly. So let's um, jump right in. Um, and I'll throw this at to both our co-authors today. Um, why did you all write the book? Or like, what were you trying to get across? Uh, yeah. So why don't you all start? Uh, well, I'm sure we both uh, are going to speak to this. Um, so basically we were, well, first of all, we've known each other for a while, all three of us actually. So we hope this will be a really good conversation um, and dialogue between the three of us uh, going back to participating in movements in New York mm -hmm. and other cities um, and we, you know, as people who participated in the George Floyd rebellion two years ago, uh, as people who have been thinking a lot about um, politics, movements, um, the horizon of movements, we thought it was one of the most spectacular 
movements that happened in recent history. Um, you know, all three of us have also participated in Occupy, right? So the George Floyd rebellion really kind of was this important spark, um, an important uprising and rebellion. And we, as participants and folks that wanted to think with others about it, you know, we wrote this book because we really wanted to offer um, an analysis of what had happened, uh, what is said about American social life, uh, what is said about the horizon of movements, about where we are today. Um, and we really wanted to engage with a young generation of people, especially who have been politicized by the George Floyd rebellion and who were grappling with what it meant um, and you know, who had participated in it or maybe had even watched it unfold. Jared. The book grew out of an essay that we wrote in the first two weeks of the rebellion called Prelude to a Hot American Summer. We published that with uh, the Brooklyn Rail uh, Field Notes page, which if you don't read, you should always check out. Um, and I think something that we were trying to do, surveying the, uh, the discourse at the time, you know, with certain notable exceptions like you, Shimon, the comrades at Ill Will, it's going down. Uh, most of the professional left commentariat was saying, um, here's what they people should be doing instead, or here's what people are doing wrong, or here's what here's the the, the, the form that is uh, inherited from the past that we need to jam into this moment like a square peg in a round hole. Um, and we wanted to take a step back and say, well, what are people doing? Like, what what are people actually doing? What is the novelty of this moment? Um and why are people doing the things that they're doing? And, and where does this point? Um, and so we developed um, a kind of social analysis of the rebellion that really attempted to meet the rebellion on its own terms, rather than judge it by the criteria of what it should have been. Great, great. Then let's just, uh, let's just dive in. Uh, into uh, the meat of the book and the rebellion and how you two kind of uh, interpret it. Um, let's start off with you both have a pretty specific perspective on what um, the attack on the carceral apparatus, meaning cop cars and police stations um, meant. Um, and you have all these great quotes. I can read some of them at some point uh, through, you know, throughout the book and really powerful examples of where this took place. Can you to expand and, and, and let the audience know what, what is your perspective on the attack on the carceral apparatus that took place two years ago? Yeah, I guess I'll get started and Jared will jump in. Um, so first, I think it's really important. Um, and I think in this way, Shaman, like some of the some of what you have been writing and talking about and other comrades of ours, right, have been trying to kind of resuscitate this moment from kind of this amnesia of the fact that like, yes, people torched down the um, precinct in Minneapolis and it wasn't, that wasn't the only form of spectacular um, reaction to policing, right? Um, police cars were burned down and torched in various cities. Uh, we do, in that, in that uh, Brooklyn Rail article that we developed um, into the book in the first chapter, there's almost a beat to uh, all of the destruction against, um, you know, carceral institutions, right? Like from police precincts to the Kenosha courthouse, um, to uh, to the juvenile detention center in other cities, right? So people were very clear about what they were targeting, right? And again, it just, it goes beyond the third precinct, which in its, itself was amazing to see, right? Happening in America, but it really was an all right attack on every, um, you know, institution of the state that was associated with policing, uh, with um, you know, incarceration, with this like really terrible, brutal social order, right? And we kind of really wanted to 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 make that clear um, that that had happened, right? And we need to kind of, as Jared was saying, like trying to meet meet it where it's at and trying to understand why it happened, what are the ramifications? Yeah, Jared. Yeah, I think um, Idris Robinson very early in the rebellion predicted that um, the most effective counterinsurgent strategy was not going really hard with the cops and the, the federales like they did in Portland, which actually just rallied the movement, 
but was the, the soft liberal counterinsurgency of pretending that the most militant aspects of the rebellion had never actually occurred at all. Um, and it, it, was, it was a remarkable magic act. Um, I mean, I was, a, I was around enough of the street activity in the summer of 2020 that there were a lot of situations where I, I looked around and said, Jesus Christ, how did you get yourself into this situation? That guy is trying to open up an ATM with a handgun and everyone's cheering him on. Right. Um, you know, and of course, I wasn't doing anything wrong. But I mean, I think that I think if we want to um, understand what happened, we can't allow the liberals uh, to whitewash the, the real good, bad and the ugly of the militancy. Um, and we, we simultaneously can't look at um, the, the crowds and their tactics like I think a lot of kind of orthodox leftists would do. And just say, oh, look at this disorganized rabble, right? Like they're just they're just waiting for their their, their leadership, or like, don't they know that they ought to form a union and all uh, all the rest of it, right? The kind of the line that Zizek put out after the London riots about ten years ago, um, and we, we wanted to say, okay, what are they what, what are they doing? What are they what are people struggling against, right? And like like Jana was saying, um, we found that the the, the police stations, um, the cop cars, the carceral infrastructure is really just emblematic of an entire social order. Um, uh, you know, American capitalism in, uh, in its present state um, is so heavily reliant on its repressive apparatuses. It's the, the primary um, form of appearance that um, the ruling class takes um, in a lot of places. And it's no coincidence that the other form of appearance that the ruling class takes in a lot of places, you know, storefronts, um, retail, uh, you know, symbols of wealth and affluence also took a beating during this time. Um, and so I think that there was something very profound going on. Um, there was a, just a profound rejection, not of police brutality, right, as if there's any kind of other policing you know, um, not of, you know, the, the lack of sensitivity or empathy of the cops, not of anything as abstract as ideological racism, right, but of an entire way of life, the American way of life in its, you know, decrepit stages of decline. Yeah, and I think something that we, we talk a bit about also in those first chapters is that um, that way of life was really made evident with the COVID pandemic, right? Americans overnight <laughs> realized that America is not a first world country, right? That in fact, um, you know, hospitals were failing, right? Like government infrastructure institutions, there was like no public health response to COVID. Um, you know, so I think that was an important backdrop too, right? Um, you know, it people were agitated, right? Um, so I think that's really important. And as, um, as Jared was saying, you know, it, it made itself evident in the targets, right? It was it was a lot of the carceral infrastructures, but also the rioting and the looting moved for the first time really in American, in the in recent history of movements, right? Moved to wealthier parts of the city, right? Um, so it wasn't just the South side and the West side of Chicago, for instance, or, you know, parts of Brooklyn or the South Bronx, right? It was like Soho, right? I was watching, I was like watching those videos. I was in Tennessee. I was watching the videos of Soho being looted. I was like, man, never in my lifetime would have I thought. So we really wanted to capture kind of the broad sense of how people uh, were rejecting a social order that the police um, and, you know, that the police and the state kind of maintain and control. Right. But it's, it's a way of life that wasn't tenable at that moment anymore. And this was the most organic self-activity of millions of pe millions of people without the direction of any leftist group, uh, without like looking at a pamphlet, you know, and of course those things existed. People were told to go to rallies, but you know, they didn't listen, right? They, they took action into their own hands. And for us, this is a significant moment because I hope something we'll talk about later on is, you know, we can imagine that this is how um, movements may continue to unfold in the future, right? Um, that there's something that happened with the George Floyd rebellion that we cannot go back to, right? Um, that the level of tactics that people were using, the you know, all of that, all of those skills, all of those things that people learned um, are kind of going to be important. And the kinds of confusion that Jared is alluding to, and hopefully we'll get into as well, it's probably what we're going to continue to see, right? Um, so I think it is an important um, moment. Um, and this is why we're talking about it <laughs> two years later, 
right? Yeah, Shimon, um, there's a great line in one of your like 57 and a half essays about the rebellion um, where you say, you know, I don't know what the people who burned the precinct were thinking and I don't want to romanticize it, but I do know that if they had listened to the leftists, <laughs> then none of this would have happened. And I think that that is really worth keeping in mind. Like a lot of folks who who go on go on you know platforms like this, you know, and who like who write about this stuff. If they were calling the shots that night in Minneapolis, right, it would have turned into a, some kind of legislative effort to defund the Minneapolis police, and that building would still be standing, and shit would not have kicked off coast to coast. I'm not, you you said it. I'm not saying it to be polemical, but let's face it; it's a fucking fact. Right. Burning down that precinct was not it was not keeping people safe. Right. It was not, you know, a slow build. Right. It was it was actually kind of a crazy thing to do when you really think about it, like laying siege to an American police station and actually burning it down. Uh, no, no, uh, you know, Orthodox leftists w worth their worth their salt would would go out and o openly advocate that as part of their politics. Right. And so this is um, this was a very new moment. Right. Yeah, yeah. And just to like build off of that, I think it was an amazing, I was looking at some arrest data recently again of the age of of the, the rioters, and they were overwhelmingly in their 20s, you know, and I think it speaks to uh, the generational difference between all the old heads who are in the left and the younger people, the Zoomers and the millennials. Um, and the fact that, you know, I, I hope one day some of these young people have a chance to listen to this talk and that they realize what they did was a huge leap, I think, in a human endeavor to tackle the carceral apparatus. And, and even if they're leftist professors or I don't know, whoever else in the left world that they might run into say there was a mistake, I hope they are not convinced of that. Um, and that even though, you know, some things look tough and I think both of you will get into that later on, you know, it isn't all roses two years later. Um, but I don't think the difficulties that we're in right now should paint a dark and gloomy picture for all of the, the next upcoming 10 years. The, the young people have set the bar of struggle very high and that memory will remain and hopefully people can build on it. And I think a lot of us who are maybe, uh, no offense to anyone here, as young as those yeah, people anymore. Gonna <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to ask for anyone's date of birth. Don't that. worry, don't worry. Um, but, you know, it, I, I think a, you know, what I really appreciate about what both of you were doing in the beginning of this panel was, unlike uh, positively, both of you were referencing the collective process of thinking through this experience. Um, not only with the ecology of other thinkers, but in many ways, you know, that it was the uprising itself that guided what you wanted to think about. And you and and the book is as honest as it can be about what the uprising was on its own terms. So I think like in contrast to a lot of other, you know, intellectuals are seen as smart people who live in their closets and come out with great books. And I think what I really appreciate about what you two are kind of situated in a different type of intellectual, right? Um, one that is actually collaborative with other intellectuals and one that traces their ideas tracking to what the proletariat does. So I think, and, and so I think that's a testament to what the young people did to return it back to their huge contribution, um, which I think a lot, of, we are, you know, in some ways we're scribes of their gigantic efforts. Um, let me circle back to a point which I think Jana uh, raised, which was, can you talk a little bit about uh, what the meaning of the looting in the wealthier parts of American cities meant? Like, wh why is that significant? Why does that matter um, for, yeah, why is that important that, that the wealthier parts uh, tended to get looted? Yeah. No, I, I think for us, when, when things were going on, right, um, that, that's another thing, too, is like we've, we've been in conversation about this for a while, you know, and kind of reflecting on that. I would say, like, you know, Jared, jump in any time, right? It's like that is significant, right? I think when we think about, um, I mean, a lot of how we understand the present, and this is something we try to do, too, right? As revolutionaries, yes, you want to look at the past and you want to look at the lessons and the limits, but I think you have to meet the present on its own terms, right? Like, what are the conditions that shape our present, that's very different from the 60s generation and the limits of black power, for instance, right? Which is, has cast this very long shadow into movements today, right? 
So I think when you look at previous wave of movements, right, I think that emerges as like a really significant difference, right? The fact that, um, you know, the magnificent miles in Chicago, like these really posh, expensive, luxury, <laughs> you know, re retail stores were looted. And now a new category of crime is being created, you know, to, to deal with this, right? Kind of that looting kind of continues, which is interesting. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that happened, right? And part of that too is the, the participation, not only of black and brown youth, but also white people who also participated in that, right? So I think those two kind of are together and emerge as like something that's very particular about our moment. And I think speaks to the crisis that we face, right? In terms of like capitalism, in terms of where people's, like livelihood is, right? Um, that people were were fed up, right? And I mean, they wanted, you know, people took stuff and sometimes they took it also to resell it, right? Like, let's be real too, right? It wasn't just like, <laughs> let's just, just destroy stuff. Um, uh, sorry, Jared, I'll give it to you. I remember, um, I think when uh, something I remember visiting my mom in the Bronx uh, during that time was listening to 18 year olds in the street talking about how Christmas is coming and they were like looking forward to like looting, hopefully still being a thing, you know, so they could get nice stuff. And I think, um, and I think we don't talk about that enough, right? That it was, it, yes, there were the, the politics of that and we could get into that, but also a lot of people participated in it for various kinds of reasons and were drawn into various reasons. And the part of it being that life is so crappy on the outside, right? And you have this moment where things are free for the taking. I don't have much to add besides just to flag that um, for the last, you know, 60 years, like since the urban rebellions kicked off um, in the, the early 1960s, the, the classic concern troll retort of um, polite white society has just been, well, I just don't understand why you would cause that kind of damage in your own neighborhood. And in 2020, I just said, I took a look at what was happening and said, yeah, I guess be careful what you wish for, motherfucker, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like all, all the kids listened to it and were like, good point. Let's go loot the rich. <laughs> There's like a certain, which I guess, you know, and, and, and on another level, it reflects that young people were very aware of the changing nature of their cities. Um, and they went after the geographic areas where the cities were changed. And that's probably inseparable from when they would try to go to those places, they got policed the hell out of. So mm -hmm. it was also an act of revenge and us, you know, young people taking back those spaces that used to be more proletarian 30, 40 years ago before the process of gentrification uh, changed it. Um, and I think, yeah, it speaks also that there was, you know, a lot of classical Marxists will be like, well, what's uh, the class awareness of this stuff? And it's like, you know, if, if you are even listening to what the young people are saying in the middle of those it, those days, they were very, it was, it was, they were very aware of what they were doing. They're like, we're going to go after the wealthy. There are chants about making them pay, you know, and things of that sort. So underlying the act of looting, it, there seemed to be, I, I, you know, I think we would all seem to search for some kind of actual, like there was class consciousness, you know, that people were like, okay, the rich have these things. We haven't had to, a chance to enjoy them. Let's go after them and get them. So uh, it, it showed, yeah, like people, people had a, people did have some set of ideas about what they were doing or set of politics. And Shimon, something I think that you've demonstrated very well and Arturo as well, um, is that there was actually some degree of organization and coordination. Um, these, these were not simply scenes of, uh, of, of chaos and wanton destruction. Um, I, I, witnessed an, I witnessed an instance um, where, you know, some, these, these, these young people were like looting the store and one of them starts lighting, lighting a fire and other people say, you stupid motherfucker, look at this, look at the window. What do you see up there? Um, an air conditioner, right? What does that mean? It means somebody lives there. And they say, oh, shit, I'm sorry, right? It's like there, there, there were a million little scenes like that that unfolded, I think, all, all across the country um, that really, like, kind of flip on its head. I think the average kind of um, white flight, you know, uh, Death Wish fans conception of what it would be like to be in a riot or be in a city that where the cops had effectively ceded terrain. Um, like, I... 
for for one of my classes, um, I asked the students to watch the Unicorn Riot footage uh, of the of the the siege of the third precinct. I I didn't tell them to think one thing or the other about it, right? Because that's up to them. But I said, just watch watch what it looked like, right? Um, and the feedback that many of them gave was like, I was just I was really surprised by how festive the environment was how relaxed everybody was, how safe it seemed to be, right? Um, whereas I think that if you've never been in a setting like this, you imagine um, it's like uh, like like a scene out of like a Hieronymus Bosch painting or something. But in reality, there's remarkable solidarity and organization and coordination that are produced in these moments. Yeah. I always like to tell my dad, and, and this is a little hyperbolic, I know, but I think that it, it speaks to what Jared you're saying. You know, uh, my dad was like, well, what if the riots come where I live? And I'm like, dad, the riots are the safest place in America that you can be in. You can walk outside. If anyone asks anything, just say Black Lives Matter. People will give you a hug or shake your hand, and that'll be the end of it. The people you have to worry about are the police. So you're kind of an older dude. Stay away from them. Follow the young people carefully. But no one's going to come out and punch you in the face. or None, none of that's going to happen. It's like a fairly, unless if you're, you know, physically fighting the cops or uh, doing some other business. It's a, actually a fairly safe and joyous phenomenon. Um, Jenna, do you have any thoughts before we move on to the next question? Are we good? Yeah. Okay, maybe we've already kind of uh, circled around this question or tippy-toed around it, but I just wanted to put it out there and if we've already addressed it, we can move on. Or if you want to add another dimension to it, we can do that too. Um, what is the political significance uh, of the riots and the anti-police militancy? And then could you, I think you both have hinted at it at times uh, as a sub question or a footnote. Can you talk about some of the limits of the riots? Because I think neither of you have any romances about the riot either. You, you're very aware of its contradiction. So could we start off with, you know, maybe Jana, if you want to go first, what is the political significance of the riots and anti-police militancy? Um, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, something I was thinking about, Shaman, because um, thinking about like young people um, and, you know, yes, we are older. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, right, like, um, but I, you know, I think so for us, uh, you know, for our generation, it was like the Iraq war, it was Occupy Wall Street, it was no doppel. Trayvon Martin in 2014, right? And I think about like the age group that participated in a lot of the riots. I mean, you know, they have really been politicized by Black Lives Matter in a really important way, right? I think for them, that has been the defining um, protest movement of America in many ways, right? So from like 2014 onward. So I thought that it's interesting to view the riots also in that way, right? So it was no longer just kind of, you know, marches that just like went on for hours on end, right? It, it kind of broke that monotony of what was expected of you as a protester, right? Like you go and you chant and you yell at some cops or you hold a sign, right? So I think even in a general sense, right, it just broke kind of the monotony of what was expected in a protest movement, right? In general. Um, so I think that's really significant. Um, the other is that I think there is, and we'll get at this, there are limits, of course, in terms of like the politics of riots. And, you know, it's not like, just rioting itself is not like just merely this political act, right? It, you know, has to have, anyway, we get into it. But I think part of it too is, um, it, it's really an outright rejection, right? It's like, we're not gonna compromise. No, we don't care to like, to make, you know, to make these cops nicer. We are trashing your cop cars. We are like, we are, taking things from the stores, right? Um, you know, our I think one of the uh, the slogans even, right? Like the future, like, you know, our future has been looted, right? Like loot back, which some of the young people in Chicago are carrying, right? Which some of us may recognize that slogan. But, you know, so I think that kind of, I think that's important, right? It's like it broke the monotony. Um, I think all kinds of things can happen in a riot, right? It opens up a poss possibility in so many different ways um, that I think, Kind of like the regular marches and the regular forms of protests cannot do right um and for the first time i mean like i you know it, people heard it right like i mean it was like because the precinct burned down 
because uh, cop cars were targeted, because the Kenosha courthouse was trying to set on fire along with juvenile detention centers and all of this, like people were paying attention, right? Um, and I think there is something to that. Um, Jared, you wanted to add? Yeah, just, um, so I lived in New York for what I now understand to be the 12 lamest years of the city's entire history. Um, from 2008 to the end of 2019. Um, and just watching some of the most frustrating obstacles to uh, movement activity in New York um, go away, right? Um, peace policing was not as widely tolerated. Um, the, um, the obsession with following the law was not widely tolerated. There was a general sense um, that we are rejecting this kind of respectability politics. There was a widespread hostility to um, self-proclaimed uh, movement managers, movement leaders. And of course, these people, you know, um, eventually were able to clamp down. Um, but I think that that was largely a symptom of the movements losing dynamism than um, their effectiveness as as leaders, because as we know, having met a lot of these people, most of them are just like hucksters or like just maybe well-meaning people who like, you know, um, are willing to, you know, go with the flow to get paid and secure a, a position for themselves in the nonprofit sector. I don't have a tremendous amount of respect for many of these folks as like brilliant strategic thinkers capable of disciplining a great movement like a million strong. Um, and so I think that that challenges us to think a little bit about the limits that it ran into. Um, I mean, I guess this is probably the place to say that, um, speaking for myself and probably Jana, I, eventually you have to pose the question of political organization. Um, like I have a lot of respect for the comrades at Ill Will, and I think they put out some of the best writing, um, about the rebellion, but I think it's a big mistake to, um, assume that tactics contain politics. Um, I mean, all you need to do is look at the, the great variety of um, political content to rioting in American history. Some of it we would want to support and some of it we most certainly would not want to support, right? Um, and so I, I think that at a certain point, um, you do need to um, take seriously the, the question of politics, Polit the, poli the explicit um, understood politics, uh, community building, um, subject formation, self-understanding, right? This is, this is the boogeyman of constituent politics, right? Um, and I, I think that on the one hand, we can look at something like the rebellion and meet it on, meet it on its own terms and talk about all the new things that it, that it did that, that really worked and that would not have been done by, you know, an orthodox political group. But on the other hand, um, Look who walked away with all the marbles, right? Um, abolitionists. And what did abolitionists have? Um, they had a national network um, of all these look, all these small groups that were loosely coordinated with each other. They had a small mountain of propaganda, um, and they were willing to step into this vacuum and say, "Hey, everybody! I noticed that you're doing something that you probably never thought you'd do in your whole life. I'm here to, to explain to you why you're doing it," right? Uh, and they were very effective um, on on the propaganda level of actually um, outmaneuvering very well-funded soft counterinsurgents, like the traditional counterinsurgent all-stars funded by the Ford Foundation and all the rest, um, even like the official Black Lives Matter organizations. From what I understand, they either got with abolitionism or had to get out of the way. Um, and so I think that abolitionism provides an example of a, a loose network of political organization that speaks to people's need for um, some kind of coherent sense of who they are and what they're doing that will sustain a struggle over time. Yeah, I guess, can you, can you, you know, John or Jared, can you go into how you two approach, I mean, Jared, you've already gotten into a little bit, but how do you two approach abolition, right? Um, uh, I'm, you know, you, you all are far left or communist, um, uh, revolutionary. So from your vantage point, how do you understand what is abolition? 
Um, and I know, Jared, you've already spoken a little bit to it, but can you set up the broad picture first for your orientation towards abolitionism? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, so we we talk a lot about that in the book and just like in general too, we really wanted to to engage with abolition because as Jared, was, Jared just did, you know, did a good job kind of describing, it emerged as like one of the most advanced uh, tendencies, right? In the sense that, of the, the ways that they spoke to people, right? Um, I think part of the abolition discourse too, um, I think they were very good at being able to, to, to describe to people why is it that in a middle of a pandemic, uh, you know, a black man dies for legit a $20 counterfeit bill. Why is it that the cops have like all these shiny toys? There's so many prisons. Uh, you know, police, right? But people can't count on a stimulus check because these Democrats and Republicans can't even come together to give people like basic necessities, right? So I think abolition did a really good job, I think, at kind of meeting people where they're at and explain to them the political situation, right? That policing, um, prisons are kind of really an outcome of severe uh, state retrenchment, disinvestment, right? And the state is just kind of this now brutal social, enforcing this brutal social order and refuses to give people anything else, right? Um, so we wanted to engage with that, right? Because we thought like, hey, that's an interesting critique, right? Um, and they were also kind of, they, you know, they were, I mean, people did take up like the abolition, like abolitionism, right? So we kind of wanted to like address why that was, right? But we also wanted to like look at the limits, right? Because I think something that Jared talked about is, you know, they they were able to kind of articulate the politics um, and say this is what's happening. Um, but I think what we need to do is something that we wanted to critique them on, right? Like for us, it was not clear uh, their take on what needs to be done, right? Um, and I think part of how they understood what needed to be done was not say, okay, there are the, the riots are hitting their limits. So how, what can we do as like revolutionaries, as abolitionists to link the struggles, to link the riots, to link the, uh, the protest Black Lives Matter to these other parts of society, right? Uh, you know, their, their answer was simply, we need to kind of rally around uh, this amorphous defund, right? We need to kind of put over all, a lot of our energy into getting cities to adapt defund campaigns where now people are going to be channeling all this like energy that they put into like riots, street protests, into, I don't know, showing up at like city council meetings to, to basically try to wrestle money away from these politicians um, to give it to quote unquote community, right? So it just, I, I think for us, it was, you know, we really wanted to engage with how they saw, uh, the how they answered the question of what needs to be done, right? Um, and we have a lot of respect, I think, for abolitionists too. And I think a lot of young people have been like, um, you know, we consider ourselves abolitionists in the sense also of a greater historical trajectory of going back to like abolition against slavery. But we wanted to like remind young people and young abolitionists of this lot larger history, right? That um, when actually, sorry, and I know Jared, you wanna, you're like <laughs> dying to get in, but I just wanna say that like, I think part of like this longer history of abolitionism that doesn't get talked enough about um, is that, you know, when you look at 19th century abolitionists, right? Um, when you when you talk about abolition against slavery, right? Which the current current day abolitionism draws this history from, right? Also a lot of it from the 60s and 70s. Um, but when you look at 19th century abolitionists, I mean, people were not like sitting back and like, you know, even the most pacifists like if you look at William uh, Lloyd Garrison, right, who would have considered been considered a pacifist at a particular moment um, during abolition, tore up the Constitution, right, and said no union with slaveholders. Uh, people took risks, right? Um, they they organized. Um, so I think we wanted to kind of remind abolitionists, uh, young abolitionists, of you know if this is kind of the movement that you're embracing, right, and this is the ideology that you're embracing. There's this longer history of what that meant in terms of engaging in revolution uh, and to kind of, to, to basically bring back a revolutionary politics to abolitionism, uh, most importantly. Again, you know, kind of like, a, and we want to like really engage with what that would mean. Sorry, Jared. 
No, don't be sorry. You put a lot on the table. I know you have a lot of stuff to add to. No, well, I mean, the two of us could go on for 10 hours, throw in Shimon, and we got like a full day. <laughs> so I'm not worried about getting the last word in this crowd. Um, no, I think actually Shimon had a, had a, a great essay um, in, I think, July of 2020. Um, was it the, oh, I don't want to screw up the name, the Black Counterinsurgency? Yeah, yeah, the rise of Black yeah. Counterinsurgency, yeah. Um, and Shimon drew a distinction between um, revolutionary abolitionism and reform abolitionism, or reformist abolitionism. And correct me if I'm getting that wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, something that struck me when the rebellion first kicked off was how out of place a lot of the um, the prevailing abolitionist discourse was. Um, and this is something that John and I talk about uh, in the book, which is that you need to realize that a lot of these tendencies in abolitionism came together in like the 90s um, in probably one of the most bum out times, you know, to be a leftist, um, you know, in the shadow of Reaganism. And we're really geared toward building a politics in uh in these piecemeal struggles on the local level. Um, and that's one of the strengths of abolitionism. And I think it's why they were so well positioned um, to intervene in 2020. But I think it's also a weakness in that um, there was nothing about the burning of the third precinct that spoke of a slow bill. Um, you know, that was not a slow build approach that, I mean, by all appearances, that was a whole lot of people who would, did not seem to have much prior political experience taking decisive action, right? Um, that completely transformed the political landscape of the country. Um, simultaneously, um, there's um, abolitionism uh, in its contemporary form has um, done something very clever, I think, in um, taking, attempting to redefine the notion of safety. Um, base, they're doing something that I think anybody who came of age in the 90s would find very admirable, which is you're, you're trying to redefine the very heart of the bipartisan consensus around crime and punishment, mm -hmm. right? Because that was, the issue, that was the issue that brought the Democrats and the Republicans together, you know, um, so famously. We, see, we, like, we have to keep people safe, right? And as we all know, uh, mass incarceration, uh, you know, uh, large-scale policing, they have not created safety, right? They've created the opposite, right? This is, and this is, a, this is a point that the abolitionists make early and often, and I think it's a good one. Um, unfortunately, it leads to this, um, a case of taking the rhetoric a little bit too, too seriously, and um, I think believing that the purpose of political organizing in the here and now is to simply create safety. Um, now, I did not see much safety in the summer of 2020. Um, I mean, and the, the, the demonstrations that were safe um, for everybody to participate in followed the traditional script run by the nonprofits and the Democrats and all the rest of it. And they were not the kind of actions that ever would have catalyzed the rebellion in the first place. Um, so there was actually a necessity for risk-taking uh, and dangerous activity um, that actually put people at risk. The burning of the third precinct put a lot of people at risk. There were bullets in that building. You lit a building, people lit a building on fire that had bullets in it, right? That's not, that's not safe by anyone's metric. Um, and so I think to my mind, um, this kind of cuts to the, the central contradiction um, at the core of abolitionism in the present, which is how are we going to get to the society that abolitionists imagine uh, because there's a there's a kind of consensus in most abolitionist circles that we are working together to create this kind of post-capitalist society based on you know the um meeting the needs of all people and you know stepping away from violence as a central organizing principle of society and um you know, and I think a number of uh, 
prominent abolitionists identify as some kind of socialist or, or communist. Um, but unfortunately, in the contemporary theory, the question of how exactly we're going to get there um, remains um, hopelessly under theorized to such a point where the de facto politics um, that is allowed to step into this vacuum um, becomes the the kind of technocratic liberalism of somebody like Alex Vitale. He's like, no, 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 we sit down with the judges and the politicians and the local, the local nonprofits and we work out a plan um, and it's, it's quite literally advocating a united front with the left wing of capital, um, which is to my mind, just the opposite of a revolutionary approach. And so um, I'm saying all this not to be sectarian, but to flag that there's, there's a massive contradiction at the heart of contemporary abolitionism that I think needs to be addressed. Um, and it needs to be addressed not for sectarian political reasons. I do not enjoy debating these things in the abstract more than anyone. I would rather do literally anything um, than have a political debate with no stakes. Even reading even mm -hmm. a shitty novel is better than having an abstract political debate that has no stakes. But I think what we saw in 2020 was that actually there's a massive potential audience for abolitionist ideas. And there's also a whole lot of people who are not going to be sitting on their hands for very long, right? If it was a precedent for what we can imagine in the future, right? You have an incredibly violent, tumultuous social order that's hurling people into these, you know, um, these dangerous, unstable social compounds um, that are going to continue to produce um, all kinds of, uh, of, of disorder, chaos, anarchy, right? Uh, and so abolitionist politics are actually very important in this moment. And there's a, there's, a, there's a big role that they can play in this moment. But I think on the question of the relationship between reform and revolution, abolitionists need to get their own house in order. Can I ask a, a related question? And I hope it doesn't derail the conversation, but just like, Right, I mean, you, both of you write, and I'll just quote, right, you, in, in the book you say, can, and to speak to what you have said, in the book you say, can the society that abolitionists envision be attained through peaceful, liberal, democratic mechanisms and the building of alternative institutions, or will it require a decisive break with capitalist society through violent social revolution, end quote. So I guess my question is, is doesn't that same ambiguity exist among communists or the left today and anarchists and what is that I, could you just ex, expand on that because it, i could imagine some smart alecky twitter communists or anarchists being like we knew it abolitionists are, are reformists but th there's another half of the puzzle to that and if you could ex and i think we've been we maybe we haven't danced around it sometimes i feel like we've poked it right in the eye <laughs> but could you speak to the other side of that equation of what is the state of the left where if any leftist was to make a critique of abolition, they might want to think about their own house a little bit too, if that makes sense. Could you, yeah, could you all go into it and expand on that idea a little bit? Yeah, um, I don't, I mean, I don't know if this will answer it, but I think a lot about, so kind of going to your question, but also Jared's point, I think a lot of abolitionists, um, I think uh, revolution is kind of like this imagination and I think that's something that like really divides, I would say like abolitionists from a lot of like communist and other revolutionaries where kind of that is not, not just an imagination, right? You, you, you are invested in understanding what, number one, what that decisive break would be like. You're not trying to build institutions that are going to like exist on the margins of society. And maybe this is the difference between a lot of the anarchists and communists, right? Like we wouldn't see like, I don't know, com like anarchists like patching up holes in like a city <laughs> as like, you know, something that's going to take us closer to com uh, to communism, right? Uh, Jared might disagree. But I, so I think for me, a lot of the abolitionist politics is like there there is this idea that the, the this, and they're right, obviously, the world as it exists, it's messed up. It has a lot to do with uh, state violence, the, you know. But how they're going to get how they're going to get to that post, like to that visionary world, not only is it not clear, but they believe that it's in the here and now that that is going to be built, right? So it's through the slow build. 
but I would say it's also through um, alternative institutions that don't rely on the state, right? So in a weird way for me, actually abolitionism shares a lot with anarchist politics, right? Like kind of a lot of pre pre uh, prefigurative politics where you believe that, um, you know, and these are important things, right? Like transformative justice or institutions that where people are going to come together and address harm and uh, address like relationships, right? That may have been harmed by individual action or whatever, right? But I think for them, uh, for a lot of abolitionists, that is an important part of the society that they're building or that they're trying to build towards, right? Whereas I think for myself and Jared and all of you, right? Like we were kind of questioned that, right? Is what kind of an institution is that? Is is that an institution that's challenging capitalist society or social order, right? Or is it just kind of maintaining, um, you know, playing a role where it's like maintaining a function that the state cannot deliver, right? So I think a lot of like the abolitionist uh, in the here and now institutions kind of actually have the potential to over time be co-opted by the state, right? Because they're kind of like essentially providing services um, that the state cannot, right? So it's like, I think that's an important part of the abolitionism. For them, it's like, th that is um, those transformative justice, those like institutions in the here and now uh, are vaguely connected to this post, uh, to this like future society that's free of prisons. Um, but I would say that they actually are coexisting with capital, right? And they're not challenging it in any way. Um, so I think for me, that's like an important tension in a lot of like, a lot of what I see in abolition. I think that, I mean, I agree with a lot of that, Jana, but I think Shimon's question cuts a little bit deeper. I mean, we're assuming a lot of things about, um, about leftists, about, Self, self-declared socialists, communists, anarchists. If we're uh, someone read your cars essay, Shimon. Um, <laughs> no, um, I think that I think Shimon's point is you could say the same shit about about socialists, right? I mean, like, what what do we discover uh, five or six years ago that you know a lot of people that you know we thought we agreed on um, every principle of Marx with suddenly decided that the the best path to socialism was to elect a single person to the executive branch, um, <laughs> who happened to be about 80 years old. Um, and hilarious. I mean, I even canvassed for the guy. I thought he was great. But I think that um, the, the Bernie moment um, mm -hmm. actually demonstrated that a lot of people who might, uh, might you know, espouse revolutionary politics in practice actually are um, geared towards um, a reformist horizon um, and and also I mean if you look at the the kind of dismal showing of a lot of left tendencies in um, in 2020 um, like I don't want to name anyone in any massive national organization in particular but like um, I mean if you were like a if you're actually a, a, in a, a revolutionary organization and suddenly you know um, there are people you know rioting and fighting with cops and you know um it, i mean it, to my mind that's when you would put out the call saying all hands on deck right mm -hmm. i mean uh maybe, maybe I'm, I'm showing my my adventurous blankest side or whatever but like i just don't understand anybody who didn't go super hard in 2020 uh and still wants to talk about this stuff in earnest um and so i think what shaman is saying is that we put our finger on a much um mm -hmm broader uh, feature of so-called radical politics in the present and that we might be going a little bit too hard on abolitionism as if it is the only place where you can find this contradiction. Yeah, that, you know, I mean, it, that it's a general problem of all political ideologies or formations today. Um, you could look at it, whether it's the class basis of communists and anarchists or um, whether it's the fact that they've, many of us have grown up in quiet times, if you want to consider this stuff before 2020 quiet. Um, but also that capitalism, you know, has, has power. I mean, you know, if, if capitalism has the potential to assimilate uh, abolition, it's clearly assimilated communism, right? I mean, Russia, China, Cuba, North Korea, the list goes on and on. And, 
And so, right, if the if I were an abolitionist, and I I'd be like, well, we might that might happen to us. But that's definitely happened to you all, <laughs> to the communists and stuff, right? And so it it it. So I think like, yeah, the the yeah yeah like I think there's a there's a you know my my there's I mean sometimes when I'm upset at the universe, I just define communism as one word: courage. That's what we need right now. We need, there's tons of smart people in the world. I think the humanity has been never smarter than it is today. Um, uh, you know, there's a bazillion professors, all this kind of stuff that's really great. Yahoo, you know, blah, blah, blah. What the world lacks is people who have courage to, you know, to, to and believe in something and then go out and do it. There's this, there's this great line from an, uh, 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 um, an essay from Ill Will called Imaginary Enemies by Nevada. And, and it, I think it captures a lot of what we're kind of debating and discussing. It says, it says this, it's one thing to hold a sign that says redistribute the wealth. It's another to decide that all that shit on the store shelves is ours for the taking and take it. Right. I mean, I think that like this to me, I'm like, if, I, if someone asked me what a communist is today, I know this is very impoverished, but this is the, this is where the American left, I think, is positioned what the definition of communism in certain sense has to be because it's it's courage. When when you see when you see masses of people hungry, you don't go begging the master for food, you just go take the food or the places that produce the food, you know. And and it's strange that communists themselves have become beggars of the masters. You know, this history has such a rich tradition of, right, you don't bow down to the master or rooted in the history of, a, of, of anti-slavery struggles. You defeat the master. And yet communists bend the knee quite a bit for all the talk. They bend the knee, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so, uh, just before, oh, go on. Sorry, Jana. I was just going to say, I think part of it, too, is the political imagination too, is like, I think um, we're actually in a really dangerous moment, right? Because I think what we've been seeing, and I think um, kind of your question gets at this too, Shaman, um, is that it's much easier for leftists to see uh, an alliance with like the, you know, liberals or to see, kind uh, to, to, I think the, for them, for the, for the horizon to be social democracy, then like, outright revolution right so and i think that's a question of courage it's a question of political imagination it's a question of like what you think is possible and i think for many people i mean unfortunately i think for a lot of people who would could consider themselves marxist communist is like the horizon you know is right now it, a struggle whatever is social democracy because they still believe that that is going to get them to communism right um and i, I don't know that we've actually broken that like that link apart yet, right? So I would say that's still like the horizon of a lot of radicals, you know, in the current moment. Um, and how do you get there? You know, you you enter into alliances, right? Um, and I think Trump made that more of a possibility, right? Because it was like more of a threat. Um, but I, I still think like there's a lot of hope um, in, you know, progressive wings of the Democrats, even as they show that <laughs> that is like no longer possible. But I still I still think that the political imagination of most radicals is still social democracy, you know? Well, and that's Maybe. why, just clear, like go on Shamal, please. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So if you're if you're still watching and you're saying, what are these sectarians going on about? I just I really just want to emphasize this is not the player haters ball. Um, we like speaking only for myself, you know, um, these are deficiencies that um, def have defined my entire political life. Um, I mean, coming coming of age in uh, New York, if we could get a march off of the sidewalk, like we thought that we were like storming the Winter Palace, basically. Um, and it's actually, um, it's, you know, the, the nightmare of desire is its fulfillment, right? Um, it was actually in the 2014 moment when suddenly you could do all kinds of shit that you'd never even really thought of before that I think a lot of us had to face how impoverished our own imaginations were. It's like, oh, let's block another bridge, let's block another tunnel. It's like, okay, but what, what is this actually, what is this adding up to? And so I think I think that that's, that's the central importance of these questions is really like, is it's diagnosing and attacking a general malaise uh, of, of imagination. Um, and this is where just to, to, to bring it back to the, the heroes, the, the, 
the anonymous heroes who kicked all this shit off. Um, I think this is where the George Floyd rebellion serves as, um, as a model and inspiration. I mean, um, people's horizons politically are not generally opened by um, exposure to political ideas. Mm. Right. Uh, and this is, this is the wisdom of the, um, the memes without end article uh, written by Adrian Voloban at, uh, at a will. It's actually people see, you see something that you've never. Yeah. thought was possible. Um, and like, if you, if you ask people, they're like political origin stories, like movement people who've been around for a while, you're, you're likely to get a story like this. Like I was at some March and it was whack. And then I saw the black block and I said, Oh my God, whatever th those people are on, I want to do it too. Right. And so it's like you see these moments when suddenly everything that you took for granted is just shaken up. And you say, "Wow, we can do we can do anything, right? Like we could do with 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 a large enough crowd. I mean, you, you can you can take over a you know a, a small chunk of the city, and you can just and you can take it from there, right? Um, you, can, you can actually watch as you know cops in cities like New York and Chicago retreat, right? I don't think many of us who came of age in the late 20th, early 21st century saw many sites of large lines of well-armed police officers retreating, but it can be done. It's possible, right? And so I think that this is to my mind why two years later, at the risk of becoming a historical reenactor society, we are still talking so much about the rebellion, is it provided these, this opening where, where millions of people saw what we could actually do um, and that I think we should take that seriously as the contours of kind of a new political horizon. Yeah, maybe that's a good way to segue to exactly this question, Jared, which you've opened up and maybe we, we can go back and forth. Um, why are you all still excited about the uprising two years later, right? I mean, yeah, this is not a reenactment, you know, historical archivist uh, discussion of the uprising. Why two years later are, are we talking about it? Yeah. Jenna, you want to jump in first? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think it it was it was important to see like millions of people. Just I, I think I think for me, COVID was also an important part of it too. I think we expected a lot of I don't know as you know somebody who is not from America who like kind of grew up in another country and, and migrated here. I always thought Americans kind of were very like very submissive kind of like just took a lot of stuff right so it was i think it was really important to even see that the most like the country that's like steeped in capitalism right where people where everyone believes that they're going to be the next elon musk or like billionaire entrepreneur right like if you talk to most people like that's what most people want to be right i think to see that being broken and in the course of like a few months people just saying like no this is not the the way that we want to live life we are like taking to the streets we're fucking shit up like i think that was really important right to see kind of just mass mobilization and mass movement and different things right i think for sure like um like riots but there were all kinds of uh, protests right that happened they happened not only in big cities they happened in small cities they happened in rural towns um i just thought that was like so interesting to witness um just like i think having a little bit more of that outsider perspective, like just never imagining, um, you know, obviously we didn't live through the sixties. Right. Um, but like to kind of see like a, American society where people are like in many ways, so docile, like saying no enough is enough. Um, I think is really important, you know? No, I really want to echo that Shauna. And, um, I think that I'm glad that you, turn the spotlight onto some of these places that might not have been as spectacular as, you know, the big cities with the, with the large youth subcultures, um, but were very significant. Like my hometown, Weymouth, Massachusetts, right, in the Irish Riviera, um, had a, a large protest, a large Black Lives Matter protest. And suffice it to say that a lot of the attitudes that I was surrounded by as a young person were not exactly conducive to BLM. Um, this is a working class Irish Catholic um, part of the Massachusetts with a long history of um, racism born out of uh, segregation and the, um, and the long kind of um, anti-black tendency within Irish American 
uh, working class people, right? Um, and we could go on about that. But I think that when I heard that there was a large protest in Weymouth, Massachusetts, I said, Jesus Christ, that is more socially significant than a large black block in Portland. I mean, I think they're both awesome, right? But one thing happens pretty regularly and one thing happened for the first time in uh, 2020. And it, I think that these are symptoms of um, a lot of social transformations, right? That were that were taking place, that have been taking place, right? Um, but that also went into warp speed with COVID and then um, with the with burning of the the third precinct. And so you have a kind of a new sensibility in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. There's um, there have been leaps and bounds, I think, away from um, colorblindness, right? As it was defined by Michelle Alexander uh, back in 2010. Um, it's very difficult to find um, so, uh, someone espousing ideological colorblindness anymore unless they're just an actual reactionary. And that's now what conservatives offer as their view of society. Um, and there's a general kind of anti-authority um, zeitgeist among large swaths of young people who were politicized uh, by this by this rebellion. And I don't want to um, I don't want to overstate um, the the forward march of consciousness, right? Because if that was true, we'd be living in utopia by now. People forget. People do. People do crazy shit, and then two years later, they've they've forgotten all about it and what it meant and why they even did it, right? I mean, you could you could probably embarrass a lot of people today, even by confronting them with things that they did and said in 2020. Well, I think uh, also what happened is that um, the liberals have done such a good job also of masking what happened, right? I think one of the most important things that I thought was like, I thought like like so many white people participating was like so significant, right? And it's like, well, look at what has happened two years later. Like liberal anti-racism has just become kind of the de facto explanation of what whiteness is. So I think like the whole, the, a lot of the, you know, the stuff like in around the nineties, right? Which, which was like, yes, you know, um, white people need to like look inside themselves and like, I don't know. Now it's like, yes, white people look inside yourselves, but also go, uh, go support like, you know, a black nonprofit organization. Right. So it's like, I think, you know, which is not as better than other things you could probably be doing. But I think like that kind of, um, I, I think that kind of, uh, how they've taken, like how liberals took over, like a lot of like the anti-racism aspects of the potential of the rebellion, um, I think does a lot to like the amnesia, right where people like forget that, yeah, like uh, white people participated. Some of them actually took risks. Two people that died in Kenosha, right, were white. So I think like how that gets told, right, um, changes. All right, Shimon, you've gotten away with this long enough. What do you think? What, yeah. What's the enduring significance of the rebellion from, from the vantage point of two years later? Yeah, uh, I guess I'll... Uh, I'll skirt that for a second. If people who are watching have questions, um, they should, uh, you know, we'll, we'll Jared, Jana, and I will talk for a few more minutes, but uh, write down your questions, throw them in the comments, and um, we'll, you know, Jared and Jana will field them. But, okay. Um, yeah, why does uprising matter two years later? I mean, one, it isn't that long ago, right? I mean, people still debate the meaning of the Russian Revolution or or the French Revolution, <laughs> those things happened <laughs> quite a while ago. Um, <laughs> two, um, is, is it was an, a profoundly important intervention of the American proletariat in the context of a pandemic um, to settle scores with the carceral apparatus. Um, and for a decade and more, abolitionists and activists had been trying to settle scores and we had our cute little signs and we'd walk around and look real cute and wear our little black costumes and all that kind of stuff and not much happened. And in a matter of a week, right, you can look at the data, hundreds of cop cars in New York City destroyed, literally, like, that's, that's, that is the literal definition of abolition, you know, the, the, the eradication of the carceral apparatus. Um, so if, I mean, I, you know, I think abolition has a relationship to communism. Any communist revolution has to be abolitionist and ab any abolitionist movement has to deal with the question of anti-capitalism and communism. There's just no way around that. And so- And I think those, the race, the color line in the United States, right? 
Absolutely, right. I mean, th- I mean, what's phenomena, uh, the last thing I'll say, there's so much to be said about what that experience means for class struggle in the U.S. is, is that the particular style of black struggle divides white society in a very particular way um, that creates, right, white people have to decide, are you with black struggles or are you against black struggles? And that is in in this in the context of this country, we all know what that means. We can hearken it back to the civil war, to the civil rights movement, to black power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so today, if if Dr. King was looking for large groups of white people to build his beloved community with, he did not find it. Um, I think it is for the first time in 60 years an open-ended question that there might be masses of white people who want to rebuild Dr. King's beloved community or, or what I would, you know, or what we might call communism. And I think that's a, you know, contrary to what a lot of BIPOC people think, white people are, a, I would argue, are a very important factor of, of class struggle in the U.S. and you cannot dismiss them and you certainly cannot militarily defeat white people because I'm sorry to all my BIPOC comrades, we don't constitute enough people in this country to take on all the whiteies. So we have to have a strategy and a politics that divides the whites who we can make an alliance with and the whites who we do we have to defeat, right? Um, and I think that's an in, 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 that is an inherent attribute of the black liberation struggle, going back to James Boggs and uh, uh, James Baldwin and other people where black revolutionaries new white people very, very, very well. It behooves us to understand what's happening to white people still in this country. Otherwise, they're all gonna go in one direction, which is Donald Trump. And that's right, and that, that's, that's, that's a disaster. So yeah, I think the significance is, is, is so multidimensional that the fact that we, right, we, we are not talking about it enough, that it's so important that you all wrote your book, Hopefully it'll be a basis for a new set of discussions about what the hell this experience meant. Because um, if we're still debating the Russian revolution a hundred and some odd years later, we certainly owe the George Floyd uprising some more discussion and debate in the upcoming five years. Not just because we wanna talk about it, but because we need to draw the connection between that experience and communism and abolition. And if you don't think they're connected, then it it, it goes back to y'all's definition of abolition. Is it begging the master? Or is it destroying the master? Which one, if it's begging the master, shit, let's all become CEOs to Walmart and try to replace the fucking master. What's the goddamn point of begging the goddamn master? It just, it, it, like that boggles my mind. Get Destroy the table, kill the master, and build a better world, right? And that, that's, that's the tension we face. So I see you got me all hyped up. I got calm down. <laughs> we love it. I love it. I think it also, Yeah, I think it also showed, I think to kind of go back to I think it's like it also showed what happens when you don't have a clear set of politics. Right. And I, I think I think you all made the good point. It's like it's not per se abolition. Right. It's like we could all take a moment, step back and say, like, OK, what are we for? Right. Like, what are we, what is the world that we want? How are we going to get there? And I think part of uh, for me is like I think part of like talking about this two two years later is I think it's an opportunity. Right. To always clarify, like what you're for what that world is, how are you going to get there? And to continue having those conversations, because guess what? Like the right, like, you know, the crazy fire, right? These are things they talk about, right? They're talking about the kind of world they're trying to live in and how they're going to get there, right? So I think I think it's important. And I think it, it also kind of in retrospect, looking at two years later, I think we also learned the lessons of what happens when we're not clear about those politics, right? Because um, I think it was so easy for, for defund to take place to 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 take to uh, to take the place of actual politics, right? So um, it was like we had this spectacular multiracial movement, which was like amazing to see, right? Um, and rejection of COVID, nonetheless, right? Where most of us thought, oh, Americans are just gonna kind of like accept this, right? Um, rejection, and then what happened? It got kind of like taken into you know these like you know, defund campaigns, which was like, let's attend more city council meetings to take this amount of money into communities, which is really not clear what communities, who is the community, who's taking what. Um, So I think, I think for me, it's also what happens once, you know, when people were not really clear about the kind of 
of what they wanted, right? Um, it became really easy. Um, and I think maybe that's because people thought it was possible. I don't know. But like defund really took 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 the place of politics, right? And now two years later, we see what an enormous failure that was, right? That defunding has not taken place, that, you know, that entering into these alliances with liberals or hoping that like the next couple of years we'll see the emergence of more AOCs is just like a pipe dream, right? Or, or trying to make the Democratic Party more leftist, more progressive, um, is also a failure. And I think those are like important lessons that I don't think we have like actually taken a step back and like recognize the failures of those alliances and something that for better or worse, a lot of us cast, <laughs> cast things behind, right? Like the Bernie phenomenon, like all of that, you know, in many ways a failure. So I think, I think for me, that's also part of like two years later, looking in hindsight, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you all, I know also in, in my kind of explosion, I, I didn't want to uh, take up too much space about the participation of whites in the movement. Did Jared or Jana, did you all want to circle back to that and, and add uh, or say anything different around that specific question? Because that was something that was pretty unique uh, that occurred uh, in 2020. So I just wanted to make sure we all had a chance to kind of share our thoughts on it. I can't really add much, Shimon, that you and Arturo didn't say in your uh, fantastic essay, uh, The Return of John Brown. I believe there's a question mark in there. Um, if not, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> but no, I think that you were correct and you, you took a lot of shit for it, but that is your that is your role sometimes. Um, you, were <laughs> you, uh, you were correct. Uh, to point to this as a socially significant fact. And I think that actually um, what you saw in the debate around that question was the difference between a strategic orientation and a moral orientation. Um, so I, I read a number of you know snarky kind of responses um, to that piece. Um, and it was, they were generally to the tune of we should not be centering white people in this discourse because we live in a white supremacist society and, you know, white supremacist society is constantly throwing up all these like mediocre white motherfuckers and telling us that they're the best people on earth. Right. And we know, we know all of the arguments, right. We can make them very well. Right. And it was a, basically a compelling moral argument for why you should not be talking about the white participants in the rebellion. Um, but it was not a strategic orientation. I mean, you had a strategic orientation. You, said, you basically said, this is an important part of the struggle, right? Um, like it or not, right? Um, and, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, white guy myself, when I meet non-white people who are suspicious of me, I say, you are correct to have that suspicion, right? White, all white people in the United States have done more than enough. If, if not them, then they're they're you know, ancestors to earn that suspicion, right? Um, the suspicion is well-placed. It's a good instinct, right? Uh, but nonetheless, um, the um, any kind of serious revolutionary movement in the United States will stand or fall um, on what you call um, a civil war within whiteness, I think. Just basically a, being able to chip away a large enough fraction of white America away from the alliance with the ruling class um, that has constituted the bedrock of American whiteness since the colonial period. Um, and I actually think that it's potentially disastrous to, fra to frame it as a moral question. Um, I mean, it's, um, it's, ta it's almost proposing um, revolution as a suicide mission. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah, Jana, do you want to jump in before we go to the questions? Yeah, just one second, then yeah. we'll go into the question. I think, yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I think that's a really important point um, um, that Jared kind of um, re reaffirmed. Um, I think also something that I think a lot about, um, I think we are also, so I think the George Floyd Rebellion, looking at 
the potential for the way in which white people participate in the rebellion for different reasons, right? I'm sure there were a lot of white liberals who were just like, I just want to like, this is outlandish. I mean, it was outlandish. It was nine minutes on video. Like you had to be a white reactionary to think that that was okay, right? Um, the George Floyd murder. So I, I do think like, you know, there probably was also a lot of white liberals, right? But again, part of it is that we just don't know what will continue to happen, right? But what we have seen in terms of what the George Floyd rebellion revealed about whiteness is kind of these, these, uh, uh, these fissures, right? That there there are white people that are, are moments notice willing to take risks and participate in an uprising. There are others that are also arming themselves and coming to protest to, you know, to defend property and have reactionary leanings, right? So these are like an important part of like, you know, this monolithic whiteness that's being broken apart that we just don't know what's going to happen to it, right? It's how it's going to continue. I mean, we have the uh, the the East Buffalo shooting, right? As kind of one indication of where some of that whiteness is going. Uh, but, you know, we continue to live in the pandemic, right? I, I do think also a lot of the material benefits of whiteness have changed for a lot of white people, um, you know, especially white youth uh, who find themselves a lot of times in jail for substance abuse or who, whose families, have relationships to the criminal justice system who don't have good jobs, who also work in like service industry, right? So I think like a lot of those things are happening um, also that, you know, that are going to unfold, right? Or we could see unfolding in different ways. Okay, okay. Um, let's jump to some questions um, from Lucas Carter, we have, is another moment of upheaval on the scale of June 2020 possible in the foreseeable future without another coinciding interruption in daily life like we experienced under the pandemic? So, yeah, Jared or Jana, go for it. Well, Lucas, I'm afraid that my crystal ball is in my office. Um, all kidding aside, um, I don't fucking know, but I do think that it's a great point to emphasize the the role that the pandemic played. Um, and actually, this is something Shimon said uh, early in the rebellion, is that it's like a lot of people don't want to consider this an anti-lockdown protest, but in a lot of ways, that's what it is. Um, and that was actually a really interesting way to think about the the kind of moral the moralism and the, the dualism that, that left is presented between these large outdoor protests and anything else, right? Uh, the right, the right word, they were awful devils or whatever for their stuff. And for ours, we were, we were doing the good Lord's work. Right. Um, but I, I think that given the calamitous nature of um, global capital, um, and I, I recently read the Schwang book, social contagion, and I think they make the case very well that what we what we lived through in the last two years was, in a lot of ways, kind of the opening act of a new period, just defined by intense turbulence, characteristic of um, an increasingly tightly interwound capitalist order, prone to all kinds of. Mm -hmm disasters that we might not even know about yet. Um, and I mean, they spend a lot of time on the biological side of it and they make a very good case for why um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is something that we can expect to see more and more of for you know, a, lot of, a lot of scientific reasons we don't have to get into. But um, I think that the, the, the short answer is I will be very surprised if we see um, anything um, like a protracted return to social peace in the United States. Most of all, because what we saw um, in 2020 was really the, um, the temporary uh, mm. collapse of the old way of um, enforcing social peace in a previous crisis, right? What was, uh, what was mass incarceration and austerity? in the 1970s, but um, the state's kind of heavy handed response to a prior crisis of capitalism. And so it's not like they can do that again, right? If anything, they're just trying to hold on to their old stopgap measure 
which is, you know, was directly contested uh, in the streets and, and I imagine will be again soon. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to add too, it's like, I think it's so interesting when I think about like growing up in the United States, um, something that I've noticed that was not the case like four years ago um, is that people talk about politics in an everyday kind of way. And it also seems that there are like these important divisions in how people understand themselves and where they lie in politics that just seem unsurmountable outside of like actual, <laughs> you know, clashes, right? And they're not just going to be ideological clashes, right? They're going to be clashes in terms of, um, you know, protests, right? Pe uh, streets uh, happening in the streets. So I just... I just don't see like the deep divisions in American life being resolved through, I don't know, some kind of conversation or like Biden promising things that will never happen. Um, and then people kind of latching on to, oh, well, in two more years, we're going to have to do through the election cycle again. And we're going to have to like pin our hopes on electoral politics. I just think the way, you know, I hear everyday people think about the world and understand these divisions um, it seems like our horizon is going to be more of more, more movements, more protests and, um, you know, and not, yeah. And not a lot of peace. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, let's see. We have a couple more questions. One from Kyle. Um, Kyle asks, the reformist side that comes with social uprisings like defund will happen if we want them to or not. So how should we relate to them? Uh, and a second part to that question is also, do you think that the people brave enough to act during the rebellion were convinced by the defund side to stop taking the streets or, or in other words, orient towards political reform? Yeah. So two, two questions. Y'all wanna, yeah, go ahead. To my mind, um, again, I'm probably speaking to an imaginary viewer who's incensed at our sectarianism, but to my mind, that's why I don't think anything that we have laid out um, in the last 90 minutes is unduly sectarian. Um, I think that we really need to push these questions super hard. Now, if if this was all a debate club that we were in, um, you would be a jerk for pushing the question too hard. You would be you would be uh, uncouth for asking somebody seven times to clarify uh, the steps that they wanted to take between this society and the better one that they that they were advocating. Uh, but as we saw in 2020, this is real shit. I mean, people were murdered over this, right? Um, we had lots of people, you know, lives were, were changed in, uh, in terrible ways. There's people still in prison right now. Um, this was, this is no joke. Right. And so I think that we really need to push these, push these questions really hard. How does your vision of, um, mm -hmm. a future society map onto what we're doing? How are we going to get there? And, um, you know, the, the reformists, um, who show up in these moments, some of them are, you know, opportunists or whatever, but some of them are just earnest people who are just looking to build a better world the same as we are. And we just really need to push these questions. How are we going to get there? What are we going to do? Do you really think that we can have a whole theory of um, social revolution that abstracts from the necessity of, uh, of violent struggle? I mean, do you really like that's and that's a lot of abolitionism. I'm at, we're imagining a post-capitalist society. Um, as if we can simply sidestep the largest and most concentrated uh, collection of uh, violence in world history. You know, um, and so I think that this is why we push these questions as hard as we do, not to not to be jerks or whatever. Um, I'm going to stay away from the second question because it is speculative and will lead us into nowhere good. But Jana, you should please take that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think part of the defund too is to kind of like to, to see it as like, our, po our policies was going to take us to, you know, like uh, to to like a post-capitalist society, right? And it's like defund even, I, I think also kind of, so I think a lot of things. On the one hand, I think like taking things for face value, right? And saying like, all right, 
how will you manage this, right? So already seeing like number one, that it has been a failure, but how will you manage this, right? You're, you're actually asking for chump change to begin with, right? Like, I mean, defund, a lot of it is like very small, um, you know, it was like a drop in the bucket for a lot of the, the, the ways in which the, the things that people will need to live dignified lives, right? So it's like even that on its own doesn't seem to be enough to create the kinds of worlds and institutions that people would want, right? Um, and I think secondly is, I mean, I think we're in a better position to kind of critique defund two years later, having seen the fact that, you know, most of it was carried at the municipal city politics, right? Um, which, you know, a lot of these city councils and politicians that people imagined, uh, you know, getting into um, coalitions with have like very little power to make such things happen, right? I think as like revolutionaries, we think that that the state is not just like these armed people, right? That they're, they're actual institutions and organizations, right? So police actually have a lot of power in society, right? So are police just going to give that power away? Um, no, they're maybe going to give you a million dollars to start an after school program, right? But they're not going to they're not going to abolish themselves, right? They're not going to abolish themselves through an electoral mandate. So I think it's I think it's important to kind of yeah to to just kind of have these conversations of what that entails, right? Um, you know what what does it mean to to, to embrace policy, right? Um, as the only like as the only pathway to like revolutionary change, right? Because I I didn't you know I I don't know I think kind of poking holes and like really engaging seriously with people that. Um, were convinced by defund, right? Uh, which I would say two years later, I mean, I don't know how many uh, continue to be convinced by that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe we can head towards the end of this conversation. What do you all think? Uh, yeah. Okay, um, maybe that for a closing question, I was thinking I would ask um, you to, what do you say to the 25 year old rioter who is doubting themselves today and, and not sure of what they did two years ago, not sure of the accomplishments that have occurred um, two years later? What, what, what do you say to them? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a good question. Um, you know, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm more optimistic um, than anything else. I think, um, you know, I think I would say that you've entered like, like a really important moment of history and struggle that's going to continue. So I don't necessarily see the point of like losing, losing hope. It was like, it was an important moment, right? It was an important opening. Um, and people did what they could, right? Um, I think it's important to kind of look at the, some of the lessons and the things that were learned um, and what could be achievable next time, right? But I would say, man, slow your roll because there's gonna be a lot, <laughs> a lot more fun things in the future, right? I don't think it's like a one and done deal, you know? Yeah, I guess I would add to that, that there's this kind of blackmail that we've all heard 50 times um, about the actually existing practical politics versus the revolutionary, utopian, millenarian, whatever that that we might be accused of having. But I mean, let's let's take a look at the the technocratic liberal camp of uh, American politics that never gets sick of scolding us for being so unreasonable. Mm. How's that shit going for them? <laughs> Not well. <laughs> I mean, I can imagine, you know. There's probably nothing worse than compromising all of your values in the name of pragmatism and you still fucking lose. Like, I mean, if you if you fight, a, you know, and uh, as, go as hard as you can for what you believe in and it comes to naught, um, then that's tragic. But you're in you're in good historical company with a lot of brave and wonderful people. But if you sell out everything that you believe in for fucking Joe Biden and you still get nothing, I mean, what are you? Like, how do you look at, how do you look at yourself in the mirror? You know? So, I mean, I think that 
any young person who's feeling ashamed about um, or is feeling uncertain about any um, wild shit that they did in the streets in 2020, I think you need to recapture a little a little piece of your past self. Remember what you were thinking. Remember what it felt like, right, uh, to be a part of that. And yeah, like Shauna said, you're gonna have to call upon that person in the future. So don't don't let them go too far. Okay, I think we shall uh, wrap things up, right? Um, Okay, there we are. There's Kai. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My God, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thanks, Shimon, and thanks, Jared and Jana. That was a wonderful uh, wonderful panel and also just a, a great way to end. Um, so thanks so much for being part of Red May. Um, I, I dropped it in the chat a little bit uh, at the beginning of the talk, but um, if you like what you hear, we have some donation options. Um, we have our, our GoFundMe. All of this, these are links that are at the bottom of, our, uh, of the YouTube um, channel there. So we have one-time donations there and we also have our Patreon. Um, but uh, Cinderblock, the, the Red Bay podcast that happens um, throughout the year, we had uh, Jared and Jana on um, a little over a year ago to talk about some of these topics. So um, if you're interested in that, I put the link in the, uh, um, in the chat there so you can um, have more Jana and Jared um, with you. So um, I, before we leave here, I just wanted to let you all know about some of the events that we have coming up this weekend. Um, so at, at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning um, Pacific time, we have two or three things I know about Brecht. At 3 p.m. Pacific time, we have the impasse of the Latin American left. And then Sunday morning at 11 a.m., we have art, value, and labor. Uh, so thanks for being with us, everyone. And thanks once again to all of our guests. Uh, we will see you all tomorrow at 11 a.m.